Welcome back after, after lunch. I know it's always hard after the breaks to come back, and uh, in particular after lunch, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's kind of difficult. Um, but, uh, but in the end, I think our two speakers here in the afternoon will be so exciting for you in the first session, um, the technology so showcase with many, many different aspects. So that should, I think, uh, I, I think, push the spirits a bit. And I hope you had some coffee as well, of course. So it should, it should be possible to have really a great afternoon after a good morning. Again, please get involved. In the morning, you had many different questions and uh, comments. If, uh, if you have that again in the afternoon, please do so. And for those, again, that join remotely, um, yeah, please do so as well. Send us, send us questions uh, if, if you have any. We'll always try to... Um, to, to, to bring them up in the discussion, but don't forget to, to, to really write your sessions, uh, your questions in the right session. So not in the session before or in, in, in general. I only see them um, if, uh, if they're really within the, in the respective uh, session. So in our afternoon, as I said, in, in our afternoon sessions, we are we're having here a technical showcase. So we are looking at uh, technical solutions and really a variety of technical solutions. That's why I think it will be, uh, it, it, it will be nice uh, as an afternoon session because uh, many, many different things that we are going to look into. In the first part, we are looking uh, at the technical solutions of the UPU itself um, by the UPU Postal Technology Center. And in our second part, uh, we, we have invited several uh, private sector partners. I mean, we had that partly already in the morning, but we want to really deep dive a bit, uh, look a bit more at the solutions which are brought into the, the union, into the discussions, and get a better picture of, um, <clears throat> of what those, uh, those new companies, those private partners can contribute, uh, but maybe also see where they can maybe benefit uh, for the entire global postal ecosystem. So, uh, we start with the UPU Postal Technology Center showcase, uh, which will be led by our two speakers here. We have Stefan Hermann, he's the lead TM, Mail Products and Services of the UPU PTC. And we have Gustavo Dami, he is responsible for innovation and partnership development uh, within the UPU PTC. And they will present some of the key platforms and key solutions which the UPU has developed uh, over time. They will present and talk about updates, benefits for the UPU members, and some of the projects that are in the pipeline as well. The focus will be particularly on the domestic postal system, the international postal system, the customs declaration system, and EAD, electronic advanced data. But I'll give the floor to the speakers because they know much more about this topic of us than I do. Please, Stefan. <clears throat> Thank you. Good afternoon. <clears throat> so, I will try to be not too technical. I know that after lunch uh, might be uh, difficult <laughs> to follow. Um, so, in this session, uh, so my colleague uh, Gustavo and I will present uh, the activities of the Postal Technology Center. So, we are financed by the Telematics Cooperative uh, within the UPU. Uh, so we'll present some of the solutions uh, we currently have, and, uh, and, and Gustavo will focus on, uh, uh, on innovation. So this is the, so the agenda for, for this afternoon. So I will start with a presentation of the Postal Technology Center. Maybe uh, not everybody knows uh, what uh, the Postal Technology Center is. So the operators, the designated operators should know us, but maybe uh, not everyone here. So the Postal Technology Center, so it's basically the IT department uh, of the UPU. So we provide uh, IT solutions uh, for the International Bureau, of course, but also for, the, for all the postal operators. And we try to cover uh, all the segments of the supply chain. So I will show you all the... Um, so most of the products, uh, most of the, the software applications we, um, we have developed, uh, again, to cover all the supply chain. Um, I will also mention the EAD, so the electronic advanced data, because it's something uh, very important. And another important aspect is now we, uh, our services are also now open uh, to the wider postal sector players. So that's, uh, that's important for us. That's a change, so coming from uh, something adopted by the, the CA. And then the POC uh, for the PTC, so 
PTC for post attack resist center, so for the PTC services. So it means now that now we can provide uh, services directly to uh, airlines or grand handlers or customs, uh, not to all uh, entities yet, but uh, to some of them. Uh, this has been um, uh, defined uh, in some uh, CNPOC uh, documents, and I will show you some uh, concrete uh, examples. Um, we, when we prepared this, um, this presentation, we ask, uh, we ask some posts, in fact, uh, for some testimonials. Uh, so we ask them to share some testimonials because we some uh, were interested but couldn't uh, join uh, physically here. So we will start with uh, two videos. Uh, one is from uh, Moldova Post. Uh, so they use uh, our software solution. And uh, yeah, it's again, it's a testimonial from, from the post. If we can play it. I don't know. Good afternoon. My name is Ludmila, and I would briefly present our experience in using UPU Postal Technology Center solutions. The state enterprise Posta Moldova is the single designated postal, postal operator in Moldova with its uh, 4,500 employees providing postal services in more than 1,200 post offices all around the country. The postal authorities, representing one of the base pillars of the state in the realization of its socio-economical program, provides both universal postal services and a broad spectrum of social services to the population. In our daily activities, we are using the tools provided by the UPU Postal Technology Center. For the mail management, we use IPS, which is an integrated international mail management application that combines mail processing, operational management, and EDI messaging into one application. IPS is used in our company by more than 3,000 uh, employees. For the capture and exchange of customs declaration, we are using the customs declaration system, allowing us to exchange pre-advised electronic information with the custom authority and the postal operators of the UPU member countries. CDS applications are available in both web and mobile version of the uh, use of our customers. PTC applications are useful and convenient to operate. They are facilitating operational processes. One of the main, main benefits of the application is that all the changes in postal regulations are included, and so there is no need for additional investments in, to adjust them to the requirements of the UPUs to bring more benefits and automate operational processes at all levels, levels we integrated IPS and CDS with our domestic systems. With the use of IPS and CDS, <clears throat> we have been able to automate many processes. We control the delivery times of domestic and international postal items to improve the quality of the course of postal services. The applications allow to generate reports and statistics at all operational levels. The generation of standard UPU forms is fully automated at all levels. The calculation of terminal views, the creation of verification notes have been automated. The applications enable the exchange of the electronic messages with the custom authorities and the transport companies. Customers can track their shipments individually on our website and complete custom declaration declarations electronically. We thank the UPU Postal Technology Center for their daily work in providing digitalization and automation of the global postal services. Thank you. So, um, so this was, yeah, this, this, this is a video so from Moldova Post uh, using our solution. On the next the next is not a testimonial, it's just a promotional video uh, from Cap Verde. So they use, uh, they also use uh, our software applications. And uh, one of them is um, what we call the EAD Customs Declaration. It's a mobile application. 
um, that we have developed for the capture of the customs declaration. So um, when I will go through the supply chain, I will mention that. So uh, this is a service that we provide uh, to the customers of the post uh, with this mobile application. Uh, for, for those customers then to, uh, to allow them to capture the, the customs declaration. And uh, this is a video from, from, from this post uh, to, to promote the use uh, of this, uh, this application. Aplicação EAD Customs Declaration, disponível para Android e iOS, pode, no conforto da sua casa, enviar antecipadamente as informações detalhadas para as entidades intervenientes, designadamente alfândegas e correios no país de destino, antes mesmo de esse envio sair do país de origem. Só tem que preencher as informações na aplicação. So yeah, this was in Portuguese. I forgot <laughs> to mention that <laughs> we do not have any. Uh, we don't have the English version of the of the video. Uh, so this was uh, more. This was an introduction of uh, of the presentation. Uh, what uh, what you can see now on the screen is um, so the the supply chain uh, from from end to end. So from uh, from the sender uh, to the recipient of uh, of mail. And uh, where we have solutions for, for the post. So we try to cover, in fact, um, all the steps, all the, all the supply chain, um, from, uh, again, from customer uh, with the capture of the customs declaration. Um, this morning, there were some discussions about the EAD, so electronic advanced data. Um, and we have uh, that's part of what we call the global postal model. And in the global, global postal model, sorry, we have uh, eight flows from one to, uh, to, to eight uh, with the exchange of uh, information between post, um, post and airlines. But in fact, for us, we consider that the capture of the customs declaration is the flow zero. N nothing can be done if uh, there's no customs declaration uh, captured. So this is why we, uh, we have different solutions. It's not only uh, this one. Uh, mobile app is one of the solutions we provide. Uh, we have also web solutions and we have interfaces. Uh, I will come to that in, uh, uh, later uh, for, for, the custom, for the capture of the customs declaration. And then in the process, we have different solutions. Uh, for domestic, we have uh, a product called DPS for domestic uh, postal system. Uh, that can be used in post offices, in sorting centers. And the main products, uh, the main solutions we have, we have are IPS, so International Postal System, uh, that can be used in uh, offices of exchange, uh, but it's also used for the accounting and for the exchange of uh, EDI um, messages. And CDS, that is dedicated to, uh, to the customs declaration, to the exchange of customs declarations. So these are some of the services that we provide uh, to the post, um, but we need to link, uh, to link our, the link between the post is uh, the PostNet network, uh, so that's the EDI network uh, operated, hosted and operated by the UPU. But this network is now, uh, as I said, open uh, to the wider postal sector players. So airlines, customs, can directly contact us 
and uh, we can uh, allow them to exchange um, EDI uh, on, on PostNet. Uh, again, it's extremely important uh, because for this postal global model, uh, the exchange of information between uh, post and airlines, it's, uh, it's extremely important. And in the future, airlines will not convey, I mean, will not transport mail if they don't have the data. So the, this is why it's, uh, this one is important. So we provide solutions uh, for the airlines, for the customs. Uh, we have some additional tools. Uh, I won't go into all the details here. Uh, but what you can see in the middle is uh, we have what we call the e-commerce APIs. E-commerce APIs for us is not, it's not one product. It's not a product that we, um, we provide separately. Uh, the, what we call e-commerce API is more all the APIs we have from all our different products. Uh, IPS for the mail management, CDS um, for the customs uh, data, uh, QCS, I will come to QCS later, but QCS is our central database where we store the information. But we have also the financial services uh, to link to uh, the discussion of this morning. So we have all those products and all those products have APIs to communicate and to interface with different systems. And that's the orchestration of this uh, uh, interface uh, between all these products and it can be uh, virtual marketplaces of the post. It can be, uh, uh, it can be any other uh, solution. We can interface and exchange uh, data. So this is what we call uh, e-commerce APIs because we have the data in our different systems. Uh, we can interface with other systems to provide uh, tracking information or to get, uh, to get the customs declarations, to get uh, some information uh, in our systems. So that's, um, yeah, that's an important element as well. Uh, on the receiving side, uh, so same, uh, IPS, CDS, DPS can also be uh, used. Uh, we now also have a DPS mobile. Uh, it's something that uh, we uh, uh, used to be called IPS PSD, but now part of it is what we call DPS mobile. It's a solution that we provide uh, to the postman for the delivery of mail. Uh, because again, since we need to cover uh, from leg one to leg three, so from end to end, we need to provide solutions uh, from the data capture from the sender to the final delivery uh, at the end. Um, we develop more and more uh, on mobile solutions because uh, this was also mentioned this morning. It's sometimes in some areas it's difficult. Uh, we have no electricity or uh, sometimes there's no computer. There are some small post offices where there's no computer. So we try to provide some, so, some solutions, some mobile solutions uh, that can even work with uh, just a, a 4G or 3G uh, connection to have uh, what we call the mobile post offices uh, to make sure that uh, all uh, the services provided the post, I mean, we can provide all the services everywhere. Uh, in the rural areas as well. Integration. Um, we, it's important to uh, interface and to integrate with different systems. Uh, we start with ourselves. Uh, we integrate with our own systems, uh, IPS, CDS, DPS, all those mail uh, management solutions are, are interfaced. Uh, with the e-commerce API, uh, we have also a link uh, with the financial services. So integration is, is something very important. So in green, on the left, so you have uh, the part that is for the customers. Again, mobile application. We provide uh, an application, but if uh, this morning there are discussion about uh, some uh, apps and super apps that uh, do everything. If, uh, if a post has, uh, has developed its own solution, they can still interface their own system uh, with uh, our IPS or CDS solutions. They don't have to uh, use uh, our app. Integration uh, in the, the websites of the post, it's the same thing for the capture of the customs declaration. So some posts have developed their own uh, system for the data capture. Uh, but since the aim of the, the, the PTC is to provide affordable solutions for all the posts, in fact, we provide solutions for 
uh, the 192 uh, country members. Uh, some they have not developed, or it's too costly for some posts to develop their own solution. So they can integrate our solution uh, to their website. So again, for the capture of custom declarations, but also for the tracking of information. So we provide uh, some solutions to, uh, for the post to provide tracking uh, information to the customer. Then in blue, we have uh, the post, the post itself. Uh, we have, we can interface with many different systems, uh, with domestic systems, uh, can be the import or export of data, um, but it can also be uh, sorting machines, uh, can be uh, parcel lockers, uh, can be any type of uh, bespoke system. So we can interface with all those, uh, all those systems. Uh, we can interface with conveyor belts. Uh, we have more and more examples of uh, conveyor belts conveyor belts, sorry, uh, interface with IPS, so where it's automatically scanned, uh, and then we get the information in, uh, in our system. We also have uh, some third-party APIs, so this is a bit different. This is to um, enhance uh, our systems. Um, the validation of postal addresses, for, for, for example, uh, we, we have not developed a solution because we believe that there are some other solutions on the market that uh, uh, are very good. Um, so what we want is more to integrate uh, with that. So, so we have the validation uh, of postal addresses, of, of postcodes. Uh, for the customs declarations, we have uh, these HS codes. So we also interface. Uh, with uh, third-party APIs uh, for the validation of uh, HS codes, uh, restriction and prohibitions. So we have more and more, and that's where um, we see opportunities here yeah, uh, to enhance our systems uh, with systems uh, from, from uh, the private sector, in fact, and uh, that could be uh, very useful for the post. And it's something that we don't have to develop because we don't have the expertise in all those areas and uh, we don't have enough resources to develop, uh, to develop everything. Um, with the online vendors, so we also have some interfaces, of course. Um, so I mentioned uh, some virtual marketplaces uh, from, from the post. We can also interface here, and that's, um, that's also what we call the e-commerce APIs. So, uh, if post, uh, they have their own uh, marketplace, or if uh, they have some agreements with some online vendors uh, to interface, then we have uh, a different solutions, APIs or flat files. Or, um, as a concrete example, for example, when you have, uh, in some countries, you have... Um, uh, online vendors uh, sending so a lot of items uh, abroad, so what they do is that uh, they send uh, bulk the customs declarations to the post. And uh, one big file containing uh, uh, hundreds or thousands of customs declarations, uh, and the post can import that in the system, and within a few seconds, uh, we have several hundreds of customs declarations uh, in the system. Uh, they can import also some uh, uh, useful information for the tracking, um, same directly into into the um, into the systems the, of the post. Something else that was mentioned this morning is about the um, uh, e-government services. We have more and more requests uh, around this. Um, post would like uh, to provide more services, and uh, we have more and more requests uh, around this to implement some some additional services uh, to interface. Uh, with different uh, uh, portals from governments. So we have that, and we are working on that uh, uh, currently. We, uh, we have developed, uh, in the DPS application, we have developed some interfaces for a post uh, to interface with uh, uh, some, some different ministries, uh, or, for example, the re renewal of uh, uh, driving licenses. So now it's something that can be done through uh, the website of the post, uh, through, in fact, the DPS application. 
And behind that, we have uh, the portal of the government, but the front end uh, is something, uh, is, is an application developed by, by us. So we have more and more requests uh, around this uh, to provide more and more services. It's not, uh, it's not limited to the, the uh, let's say, the, the postal sector, but we need to, uh, post need to provide more services. So, uh, so there are different solutions that we, we develop for that, and we are quite flexible here. Um, for e-commerce, uh, just to continue on e-commerce, uh, we, we are also... Um, uh, we are also involved in uh, the deployment uh, of those solutions and uh, um, with some workshops. We, uh, we are invited regularly to some workshops on e-commerce uh, so, to promote first, to promote our solutions or even to discuss how to optimize with some posts uh, because some posts, they use different type of solutions so we discuss how to uh, interface all those solutions, how to optimize uh, all of this. And at the bottom, you see that all of them are uh, interfaces with, uh, with our own solutions. Is you said about each of the, of the yeah. respective parts. Uh, Stefan is here to, to answer questions. Uh, if, if you have any input for him or questions, <clears throat> so that, uh, that you can do it now. Do we have a mic? Please, over there. <clears throat> Test. <laughs> My name is Ernest Westmaas, IT manager of CPOS International Curacao. Some technical question, three questions. I know that you guys have the IPS.post database, which don't have an interface. The question is when that will be possible to integrate a third party service within the IPS.post database. The second question, we do own the whole system of IPS and CDS ourselves. That's fully API ready. We created already. So the question there is if it is possible also for us to integrate with a secondary postal office, a third party postal office. Yes. And the third and last question, who is the dedicated person linked with the developers of, of the technical team of IPS? Which, which, which we can get in contact. You? <laughs> <laughs> in fact, that's the, the team. The important. team of technical account managers. Yes, because no, it, yeah. you understand my question, right? Yeah. So I cannot go to several people yeah. and without reaching my, my answers. Hmm. So that, okay? Yeah, Thank okay. You. Um, actually, I, I, I start with this question and then I'll go back to the, the first one. Uh, no, that's the way we are organized, in fact, uh, within the, the Postal Technology Center, so you don't have access directly to the developers. Uh, the contacts are the technical account managers. So we have a team with uh, different... Uh, Yes, exactly. Yes, yeah, I can give you the details, yeah. yeah. So if you have any questions, so the, the team is divided in two parts. In fact, one is dedicated to um, deployment and training, and the second part of the training is dedicated to development. So if you have any question on the current development or future development, uh, I can guide you yeah, to the right contact. Yeah. Now coming back to the, the first and second questions. Uh, interfaces, oh, that's true that, uh, oh, maybe I should go back to the three different types of applications we have. So we have IPS, CDS, uh, DPS that can be deployed uh, on-premises. So each post uh, is in charge of, uh, I mean, has uh, the application installed uh, in uh, its own servers. Uh, so that's the main product. But we, we have also uh, the cloud versions of those products, IPS, CDS, DPS, cloud. So they are hosted in uh, the UPU cloud, uh, not in external clouds, but in the UPU cloud. Uh, and the third uh, type is uh, the dot .post version. The dot .post version are what we call light versions uh, of the applications, uh, still hosted by uh, the UPU. It's a kind of shared cloud or web uh, application. Uh, so we have these three different types uh, of solutions. 
And uh, to answer your question, that's true that for the dot .post version, at the moment, it's not possible to use the APIs. It's not a technical limitation. It's, uh, it's coming from the security. Because we have uh, ISO certifications, and uh, we are going to implement even more additional <laughs> certifications. So we have some limits. And we need to find some technical solutions uh, to comply with the certification, but at the same time, to open uh, the dot .post um, versions uh, to the post with the API. That's true that we use XML at the moment because it's uh, secured. Uh, this channel is secured. API can be secured. It's not a problem. It's just that it has to be included into uh, our certification. It's not done yet. So that's the, that's the reason. It's not a technical reason. So No, 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 no. No, no, no. We'll just add that. We'll just open that. You, you keep the version because, in fact, the dot .post version, you don't have to uh, upgrade yourselves. We, we are in charge of that. So the day we decide uh, to implement the APIs, this will just be open. This will be available for you. <laughs> uh, it's difficult to say. Uh, we are in the process of uh, getting an additional uh, certification. Uh, it should be done, uh, I think, early next year. So maybe next year, yeah. We'll work on that, yeah, for next year. It's important because, in fact, uh, more and more posts are moving from uh, this uh, file-based to APIs. So it's also important for us uh, to open uh, all the services to APIs. Mm -hmm. yes. we, because we are also in the process, in fact, of implementing an API gateway to simplify, in fact, uh, yes. to simplify the access. Because currently, you access all the solutions differently. Now, this will be centralized. OK. So may, may we move on to the next question? I think during the break and afterwards, we have a <laughs> yeah, lot yeah. to discuss anyway. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. And uh, well done for that presentation. Um, Yes, PTC has a very important role to play for the digitalization of our postal entities. Uh, what I am missing there that I have not seen from what you presented, maybe it's not coming out very clearly, is um, on the issue of mobile wallets. I know maybe from where I come from in Africa, uh, mobile wallets are more popular and they play a very key role in terms of uh, um, uh, financial inclusion. In Africa, the majority of people live in rural areas and mobile wallets uh, are very convenient in that uh, not only do you send money, but uh, you can also pay various uh, service providers from your mobile wallet and it also, to some extent, acts as a bank, and governments can use these mobile wallets to disperse uh, funds to um, uh, pensioners and uh, other people in, in vulnerable uh, groups. So uh, I don't know if you had spoken about it. I don't mind you repeating it so that it comes out clearly. Uh, I will not push like uh, my brother there to say when exactly, but uh, <laughs> uh, definitely I will be happy to hear when. Thank you. Uh, just go back to, to this uh, slide. Uh, the, the when is the, <laughs> the most difficult uh, question for me. The what, yeah, it's easier. Uh, alors, this, on this slide, in fact, uh, so reflects the, the, um, the supply chain, but that's true that, and, and agree that this, um, uh, on this slide, you don't have the financial services, but we do provide uh, solutions for financial services. Um, so we have IFS. IFS is, uh, is known for the, uh, for the exchange of money orders, so domestic and international. Uh, but in addition to uh, IFS, now we, are, we have developed what we call the UPOIP. So that's to, uh, now the, um, the tool to interconnect different networks because it's not everybody, not all posts are on, uh, use IFS. So we need to interconnect different, uh, uh, different networks for financial services. And we have what we call the UPOIP uh, for that. 
Uh, and it's open. A post can be on IFS and uh, another post use different system. They use APIs. Uh, it's a central system. They connect and they exchange um, and they exchange money orders. Regarding the mobile, there's the post transfer app uh, that is being developed. Uh, alors, I need to check for the, the release date because it, this is not in my uh, products. <laughs> Uh, I'm in charge of the logistic, but not of the financial services. That is why I don't have the, the details. But we have this application, and uh, this will be uh, the same on the, uh, on the customer side, uh, on the, this slide, an application that, uh, that will be used for, for the, the exchange of, uh, of money orders. Uh, I will try to get a confirmation of the release date, and uh, I'll provide it to you for this application. <coughs> May we move on to the big data? Yes, yeah, yeah, I'm running late, yeah. Uh, second part uh, of the presentation is uh, big data. So I'm not going to describe uh, all of this. Uh, yeah, it's again the supply chain uh, from end to end, uh, so from uh, collection to final delivery. Um, all those boxes that you can see with different colors are uh, EDI messages that are exchanged uh, on the EDI networks. Um, so this represents yeah, more than 10 million mail items, uh, so recorded into our systems, so daily, uh, so which is uh, more than 50 million uh, records uh, per day, because they can be more than one per mail item uh, <coughs> per day. So it's huge. Uh, it's a huge amount uh, of data that we need to process, uh, and we need to process fast. Uh, once an item is scanned, information has to be forwarded immediately uh, to the destination. So, so it's quite uh, huge, but we have the PostNet network, we have what we call the EDI platform to, uh, to manage that without any, uh, any problem. And all of this is hosted on our big data platform. Uh, a few years ago, we decided to change, to move to a big data platform because Again, because of this amount of data, uh, so we had to change uh, our environment in order to process uh, this volume of data. It's not only to process it, but we need to store it. And um, data is used in different systems, so, so that's why we need to keep it, because it's not only to forward the information, but to, uh, uh, to keep it for, for different um, purposes. Um, here on this slide, I would like to make a link with the discussion this morning about blockchain. Uh, I didn't plan to, uh, to include blockchain in my presentation, but uh, for me, this is linked to, uh, to blockchain, uh, having this uh, big data platform. Uh, because sometimes, from time to time, we have the request from Post uh, asking us why uh, we have not moved to blockchain yet. Um, there are many uh, answers to that. Uh, there was a slide this morning about the challenges uh, to move to blockchain, and uh, we share uh, some of the concerns that were raised this morning. Um, we have the data privacy. It's uh, something extremely important for us because we don't own the data. Uh, post own the data. Uh, they just, we just convey the data from a post to another, but it does not belong to us. So, so that's why it's very important. When I mentioned the servers and uh, the big data platform, for example, uh, data is not hosted into uh, some private clouds. It must be into our own systems. Uh, that's uh, because of the special status, because we are the UPU, uh, we cannot uh, store our data outside the UPU. So we, they are stored in data centers, but all the hardware belongs to the UPU. Uh, so we cannot use the hardware of those data centers. So they have to belong to us. Uh, so. Blockchain will be the same. There will be some questions about data privacy, um, data storage. Uh, but first of all, what we need is uh, regulations. Uh, it has to be in the regulations. We cannot do that. The PTC cannot do that if it's not part of the regulations and standard. Uh, this morning, this was mentioned several times. We need standardization because then we need uh, interoperability. The problem is there might be a UPU blockchain, but uh, maybe some post could decide to have their own blockchain. So we need, uh, we need uh, to interface here. So there are still many questions uh, around blockchain. Uh, 
And another important question is uh, what would be the benefits? Because when Post asked, uh, they asked me why we, are, we have not implemented blockchain, for example, to replace uh, the current solution to exchange EDI messages. We said, why not? But what does it bring uh, to move to blockchain to exchange EDI messages? Maybe there are some benefits, but then what would be the cost? Uh, we have something that is maybe old, but works fine. It's not costly. So why not moving to blockchain, but it should bring some values uh, to move to blockchain. So that's why we do not rush in moving to blockchain. And uh, I think we'll have good opportunities now to discuss uh, with companies that are expert uh, in blockchain so that uh, we can explain uh, or we can raise our concerns. They can explain what, uh, what solutions they can propose and maybe we can uh, go ahead with uh, some, some changes. Uh, but this is to explain why uh, we are not there yet. So rapidly, yeah, we have different use cases for the big data uh, platform. Uh, so we have some dashboards uh, that can be used by the, by the post. Uh, some reporting. Uh, so we have many reports that are accessible, so based on all the information we have uh, on our, our big data platform. Uh, they are not available only to the post, but some are also available for the wider postal sector players. If we have carriers uh, on Postnet, then they can also access uh, to some reports. Uh, we use it for the monitoring. We have the UPO analytics, so that's internal, and some operational tools uh, that we have also in place. That's for the big data. If there are any questions? <clears throat> no. No. OK, I can move ahead. Yeah. Uh, EAD compliance. So this was mentioned this morning. I have only one slide, but just to summarize, in fact, the, the EAD. So all, what, um, all our solutions, uh, again, IPS, CDS, all those solutions, uh, have been developed to assist the post to ensure that they comply uh, with the EAD requirements. So this is something, again, important for the post. Uh, we are talking about innovation. We are talking about uh, new services. And th that's, that, that's fine. I mean, uh, I'm an IT, so I'm really in favor of uh, adding new, uh, new technologies. Uh, but the main focus at the moment is to have the post uh, complying with the current regulation. So this is something important. Uh, before moving to something different, post have to comply with uh, the current regulations. Post have to uh, provide the information uh, that, that, that is mandatory to provide because we are not yet there. Um, we, I mentioned the case of the capture of customs declarations. So that, this is something in the regulations. Post have to uh, send the customs declarations uh, to the partners. But we know that in practice they don't do that uh, for various reasons, but they don't do that. Uh, so before moving to something new, uh, we would like them to comply uh, with the existing and then we can move to something new. So for data capture, it's important. So I presented different solutions. We assist not only in developing new uh, software solutions, but uh, uh, we can also uh, thanks to our directorate of uh, cooperation and development, we can also purchase some hardware uh, because when a post wants to upgrade to a new system, sometimes they don't have the, the hardware, they don't have the software, uh, they don't have the skills sometimes to, in, to install all of that. So we assist, uh, we assist the post uh, with this, not only in, in uh, installing our soft solutions, but also with the, the hardware and, uh, uh, and using our expertise. Data quality, uh, it's, uh, it's also important. We ensure the, the good quality uh, of the information because, again, uh, sending data, it's fine, but if data does not comply with the UPU standards, then uh, it's rejected and it's like if nothing uh, was sent. So that we also assist the post with data quality. Data exchange, I mentioned that already uh, with the networks and the reporting. Uh, based on uh, based on the big data. So this is uh, 
Yeah, this is a summary of the compliance. So there are many different things. The training is also something very important. We train on site. We train remotely since now the pandemic. We train more and more remotely. So we have an e-learning platform as well. Uh, so training is something very, very important. Yeah. Stefan, you, you, you mentioned the EAD compliance. I mean, that's key. Yeah. Um, but not every post is yet, or it's, it's not yet. What are the bottlenecks so to reformulate differently? What are the bottlenecks to really ensuring that everybody can comply with, uh, with EAD? I know. Yeah, that's correct. That's, that's the main focus at the moment, is to ensure that they all comply. The, the bottlenecks, the, the main problems they face is, um, um, as I said, they don't have... Uh, the software applications are sometimes not deployed everywhere in the countries. So this is why uh, I talk about uh, the mobile post offices. Sometimes in some uh, rural areas, there's nothing. So the mail is collected there, but uh, there's no uh, IT system to scan, uh, to scan that uh, or to capture the, the information. So mail is just uh, uh, forwarded uh, to the first uh, post office or sorting center. Um, but then it's quite late, um, and they have missed uh, the, the, first, uh, the first step already. So uh, deployment of the application is one. Uh, sometimes, and that's why I mentioned the purchase of equipment, sometimes uh, posts have very old hardware, and we need to help them uh, with, with this. Um, and more surprisingly, sometimes it's, uh, they, need, uh, they need us to advise them because sometimes uh, they are doing wrong, thinking that they are doing right, but actually they are doing wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, and we need to assist them, we need to explain them why they should do that differently. Uh, and this is also why um, the, at the Postal Technology Center, we also work with our colleagues of the other directorates on, on that. So we have common workshops where, where they explain what the regulations are, what they are supposed to do, and then we explain how to do that uh, in our systems. So these are some of the reasons why uh, some posts do not comply with the EAD requirements. Any other questions? <clears throat> oh. No, no, but, but since we have hybrid, you know, remote participation, we need a mic. So otherwise people won't hear you. Good afternoon. My name is Joy Dobia from the U.S. Postal Service. Um, and deal explicitly, explicitly with EAD compliance. I want to know, out of the 192 members, how many are compliant at this time, and what are their biggest impacts that make them non-compliant? Uh, in terms of statistics, I don't have uh, <laughs> all the statistics with me. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the biggest impact... Um, I will, let's go back to the first one. In fact, uh, for most of them, they comply but partially. That's, that's the point. Because our systems are deployed. Uh, the case of IPS, for example, is, uh, is implemented in uh, around 100 and 180 uh, countries. CDS is implemented in, in around 150 countries. So it's widely, widely uh, deployed and the uh, post uh, actually could comply. The problem is that in the uh, operational processes, they don't scan all, uh, always the mail items. And that's, that's an issue. That's why, in fact, they don't comply. Mm -hmm. So, in fact, uh, there are almost no posts or very few mm -hmm. posts that have zero in terms of uh, compliance with the EAD requirements. But we have many posts that are low in terms of uh, compliance. Uh, because they, for example, they focus on uh, EMS and parcels because of the revenues, but they don't focus on letters. And for letters, they don't scan them, for example. But the problem of, uh, of that is that in the letters, you have the small packets. And when we talk about uh, uh, mailed items coming from Asia or from China, we are talking about letters, and we are talking about uh, small packets here. And uh, we have seen that in some posts, they just don't scan them, because uh, we had a case of a post saying that it's too much work to scan all the mail items, so they skipped uh, those uh, small packets. 
we have to tell them, no, don't do that. <laughs> scan, scan, uh, scan these uh, mail items. Uh, so so this, uh, this, is the, this is the problem, in fact, we, we are facing. Uh, implementation is, is the first step. But again, training and explaining, it's, uh, it's, it's a long process. It's even a longer process than just deploying the, uh, the applications. So this, this is the reason why. Yeah. Any other question? Yeah. <clears throat> okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I represent a region that is quite a number of countries, um, 54, if I may be specific. And I think uh, we are viewing this EAD issue very seriously because we believe that uh, it's compliance or complying with uh, the EAT requirements is not really uh, optional, it, it has to be. And uh, I, I believe there is a lot of uh, capacity building that needs to be done, like uh, you have just said, and we, we are positioning ourselves to a point where we need to uh, identify uh, champions that are going to lead the process so that uh, when UPU is back in Ben in Africa, the fire still continues to burn because that is uh, uh, how we believe implementation of a project like this can work for, for, for all of us so that uh, at the end of the day, we don't have uh, uh, situations where there is partial compliance. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I'm sure outside of this, we can pick it up in terms of uh, that capacity uh, building. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah, just just a few words on this. Um, this is also why we have um, we are running different projects uh, for EAD compliance. Uh, one of them is financed by the Quality of Service Fund. Uh, it's called we call it the EAD project, and the aim is uh, the implementation of CDS. But we also uh, monitor and assist the post. So we have uh, regional coordinators. So they are on the field, so they are close to the countries, and we also use them. So, so, we, have, uh, so we have weekly meetings. We, have, uh, we monitor the EDI transmissions and the EAD compliance. And if we detect something wrong or if we know that a post does not comply, we contact them. Maybe sometimes through those uh, regional coordinators, we contact them and we try to understand uh, what, what's wrong. Um, I, I come back to the EAD uh, mobile application. Sometimes this was the solution uh, in some countries. They said, we have no solutions to provide to our customers uh, for the capture of the customs declarations. It's too much work when they come to the post office uh, to, because it takes time to capture the customs declaration. So we said, in that case, deploy the EAD mobile app and, and advertise on that. Uh, and then your customers will capture the customs declarations uh, themselves, so to save time. <coughs> and, and it worked. In some posts, it worked. So, so, but we are ready to assist uh, all those posts through those uh, various uh, projects. Um, the US, uh, USPS and US government, they also finance uh, a lot uh, those deployments uh, and also this assistance uh, to the post. We discuss with them and uh, when we, uh, again, when we um, notice that uh, a post, uh, the, the, the level of um, compliance of a post is quite low, then we contact them. Uh, sometimes USPS, they contact them and discuss with them. Sometimes it's only the UPU. Sometimes it's together, uh, but, but we do that. Yeah. Okay. Th thank you for the response, but maybe for, for next time, for next presentations, we would appreciate uh, uh, statistics mm -hmm. in terms of the percentage where we are so that we, we are clear on whether we are making progress or not. Thank okay. you. Okay. Yeah, and, and I think I'm following up on that. I think it will be really useful then maybe also to a use case, you know, how, as, as mm -hmm. you said, with a mobile device, suddenly a solution is found. And I think that could be extremely useful for other postal operators that in a similar situation as yeah. one that couldn't really cope with it, but with the, di with the uh, mobile solution finally could. So I think that's a very good use case and, uh, yeah. Okay, I take note for the next time. <laughs> yeah. Excellent.
Please continue, yeah. <clears throat> okay, so for the last part, so <laughs> I give the floor now to my colleague uh, Gustavo. Thank you, Stefan. So now we, we talk about, about the present, the past. I will talk about a bit about the future, about innovation. Um, why, I mean, I hear a lot of people talking about innovation today. I hear this is something I, I do on a regular basis, but not everybody thinks or sees innovation in the same way. I mean, I hear once uh, an explanation, how do you see innovation? Innovation, in other words, is what's gonna pay for your pension. And if not, then that means may, you might not have a pension in the future. So it's important to innovate, it's important to consider the, the critical part of innovation, uh, and especially within our industry. So in this graphic, you see that uh, uh, about 75% of the, in general, the companies, and this comes from a, a leading company in innovation, a strategizer, they say that innovation is important for, uh, for them. But to be realistic, only 20% of them, they are really ready uh, to do innovation and, uh, on a regular basis. And that's a very low percentage because if you are not doing innovation on a regular basis, that means you are not really doing innovation. So, but what is innovation? Uh, most part of the time we think of innovation and we think on technology. And, uh, and then we want to implement a cool app, a cool software, something that uh, it will uh, it be make, uh, identify the people uh, and we, with the post. But actually, innovation, many times, it has to be looked in the other way around. I mean, innovation, to start with, is about mindset. It's about connecting people. It's about change of culture. It's about having correct process in place. It's about having the right tools in place. And at the very end, about the technology. Because it's very well known that common knowledge usually is not common practice. I mean, everybody nowadays, we know climate change is here, but are we all here really climate change uh, ambassadors? Do we not need meat? Do we not use our car? I mean, we know what's going on, but I mean, that doesn't mean we are doing the right thing. And I think about innovation, it's very important to, that you uh, focus on creating value for your organization. And uh, because if you don't create value, basically innovation is, is, is a bit pointless. So, but it's difficult, it takes time, but uh, we really need to start from the changing the mindset, changing the people, uh, how, how we approach problems, and challenge and, and the culture. Otherwise, it's difficult to arrive to, to do innovation. Here, uh, I, I, I took this slide, of course, with authorization from, from this company, OneReach AI. They are one of the leaders uh, in the Garnet report on, the, on difficult, uh, di different uh, interaction for uh, chatbot and, uh, and communication <coughs> on, on, on different uh, uh, interaction. I mean, here they're saying that uh, for many years uh, we've been interacting, especially postal system, in the physical world. Uh, and we are using uh, one machine, one uh, mailbox, one uh, computer for one purpose. We are m currently moving more into the graphical interface uh, where with your mobile phone you can use 20 different things, 50 different things, and uh, that's very, very convenient. But I mean, the shifting is, is moving into conversional. I mean, more and more we are talking into with uh, Alexa, with Google. Uh, we are sometimes even talking on the phone with some artificial intelligent agent, and we are not even aware that it's not a real person. I mean, the natural way to communicate with uh, each other is with the voice. And that's, that's the way things uh, are moving. And, uh, it's, and it's important to, that not only we are moving into a natural uh, communication language, but we also have to change the, the paradigm and the mindset. Instead of having multi-channel or omni-channel, 
we need to move into the opti-channel. Why opti-channel? Because there is no point that uh, as an organization you say, oh, okay, I can send you the information via email, via SMS, via WhatsApp, via physical letter. I mean, when I don't need all that, probably we need to focus on what is really optimal based on the situation, based on what your customer needs. I mean, you are in your airport, in the airport, you don't want to have the information about the, the change of gate uh, receiving uh, by email because maybe you don't have access to your email, maybe you need to have a, a SMS, maybe over WhatsApp. If you are in a, I mean, just recently this summer, I was on vacation and I was supposed to receive a register letter and I didn't know there was a register letter waiting for me and only I find out when I come back and then it was too late to reply to this letter. But then there was a physical piece of paper in my mailbox waiting for me to pick it up at the post office and then it was too late. But I mean, that's, that's the, the option that sometimes are not so, so convenient to, for, for the post. So here, once you move and you actually more have uh, opti-channel, here in this graphic, you have uh, different use cases that uh, basically, once you implement this uh, new way of communication, and you can have a, a new concept called hyper-automation, then you can have uh, different use cases to automate the process uh, for, for logistics, for finance, for legal, for, I mean, the, the, the limits are, are the sky. I mean, <clears throat> once you have the process in place and you have the capabilities in, in the back and you can integrate that into your current process, also that will help for the, for the users to interact seamlessly into the operation that you have and also it will be more natural. You don't need to explain as, as many, as Job, uh, Steve Jobs was saying uh, many times, long time ago. If you need to actually explain it, that means it's not well done. That means it's not easy to, to, to use it. But now you will say, okay, but do we have time? Well, postal industry has been working the same way and fine for over 100 of years. So why, why do we need to change? Well. It's very easy. Here in this graphic, you see how long it took different uh, technologies to, to have mass adoption. I mean, the, 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 t the TV, internet, tablet, the, the time it takes now for new technologies is just, it's not decades anymore, it's years. I mean, a, a company that didn't exist some years ago, TikTok or, or Facebook or Tesla, I mean, it's a, the mass adoption, it takes only a few years. So do we have decades to change? No, no, we don't. So we live in a, in a world now that we are uh, reaching uh, Web 3.0. Web, web 1.0 basically is just looking at text, reading, it was just receiving information. Web 2.0, that's where we live today, is okay, you send something through a web form, through a chat, you buy something, finish. Web 3.0, as we were talking, it's about owning the things that you send, owning your data, owning, uh, have a, a, a type of ownership of what you do, what you do, what you, what you send, and that's where also the, the post can play a very strong role there, because as a lot of people were saying, the post, the, the, the people they trust, they have a physical place to go, and there is a, every time more and more, this line between the physical world and the digital world is getting thinner and thinner. And the post they have, a, as the CEO from Albania was saying, we, we, you, you should not be afraid to be a digital company because that's the future. I mean, when, when you are ready to change in a few years, it might be, might be too late. So, I mean, we have uh, successful cases for sure. I mean, one of the more probably less known, but uh, I know it's very... Uh, was very well integrated. It's the, the, inter the digital transformation from Denmark Post, thanks to also one company, we have one colleague here from eBooks. It was a complete uh, digital transformation of how the physical mail was going to be delivered into the, to the citizens. Where it was easy? No, I'm sure it was not. But they did, I think, the, their homework very well. They, did, they have the regulation in place. They also take into account of course, not 100% of the population were happy not to send physical letters. They, they have uh, also options for those who were not uh, willing to do it. And, 
And now, uh, I will say also thanks to their digital identity uh, transformation, I mean, almost all the population, they use their e-services, and the post of Denmark is one of the, the leading in the, in the Nordic countries. Swiss Post, they also take different approach on, into digital transformation. They are, they are also creating ecosystems for bringing the service into the, the, the citizens, into the private sector, where they can connect, where they can integrate the systems and not uh, just about physical delivery. I mean, they, they work in the, with the medical uh, sector, they work with, uh, with drones, they work uh, with uh, pr data privacy, many things that probably is not very well known that Swiss Post is doing, but they, they are creating <coughs> great, great ecosystem uh, that can be integrated. So, I mean, in other words, there is a, there is a theory called singularity theory that, uh, and that's, which talks about normally, I mean, human beings, we re rarely have the capacity to understand the technology that we see on a daily, on daily basis. We, the technology is changing too fast in order that we can actually comprehend what's going on. So, and on top of that, if you are not even moving one step at a time, if you are not even willing to take a risk, then that's even additional uh, problem for, for the industry. So it's, it's really urgent and it's really important that uh, we, 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 we take the risk and we try to learn about what is going on uh, and what can be happening in the future. And, and to be innovative, I mean, it's not just like, okay, let's just be curious, let's just use some cool apps, uh, new projects. I mean, you, it's a lot of things. You need to be brave, entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial, visionary. But I would say most important of all, one of the characteristics from any company or any person who wants to jump into the innovation, you have to stay away from conformity. Once you say, oh, I'm fine, my business is fine. Well, we lost some market, but it's still fine. We are still paying the salaries. It's also fine, but then the, the risk is very big. I mean, because the, the risk of having a conformity and just uh, then, I mean, you, you, nobody have a, a ball that can see the future, but I mean, you've seen it uh, time after time. What happened with... Uh, with Nokia, what happened with uh, Blockbuster? I mean, just just recently, I found out that Blockbuster, at one point in the in the U.S., has so many uh, stores re re selling, renting uh, videos. At one point, they even within the innovation department, they were looking into having a, a streaming services. But at that time, they say, well, wh why should we actually proceed with that if we are okay? People are still renting the VHS later the, the, the DVDs, no, no, streaming is not gonna work. And because they didn't, of course, somebody else came, Netflix, and they hate the whole cake. And that happened just in a couple of years. And, uh, and I think today there are just uh, one, I think, blockbuster shop in the US out of uh, maybe, <laughs> uh, for those who still love touch uh, uh, cassette. So what is very important, so stay away from from conformity, but I mean, today we were talking about uh, partnership. I mean, the UPU, of course, alone, uh, has been doing many things, but I mean, as you hear many times from many people today, we are really open up. We are here to hear, uh, to hear more from the private sector. Uh, the UPU cannot do it alone. The private sector is shouting uh, for regulatory uh, standards to foster innovation, because I think one, one very important point to, to mention here, innovation is not just about bringing new products. Innovation is also about transformation. Maybe we, it's, it's not just about creating a, a nice product or something with artificial intelligence. It's also creating the base in order the private sector or some other players can create innovation on top of that. And one of the best examples is the standardization. As Walter was saying, I mean, thanks to the standardization, there were different projects uh, along the years that uh, I also been working in the UPU that thanks to the standardization was created. One of them is GMS. I mean, thanks to GMS and the standardization, now over 100 countries, they, they contribute in this program. Thanks to the standardization and DNSSEC, now DOTPOS exists. Thanks to the standardization of EDI, IPS exists. 
I mean, and I can continue. I give more more examples like that, but it's important to to put the things together to create the the innovative products, but also to create the necessary base to to create additional innovation, and more importantly, to to try to do things because I mean, as as probably you learn uh, university or school, you can learn, you can read all what you want, but the only moment when you actually uh, learn or actually uh, arrived into the, as they say, the aha moment is when you try things. If you don't try, if you keep things in paper, if you don't give a try and you don't fail from time to time, that means you are not really innovating and you are not doing the, enough. Thank you. Are there any questions for Gustavo or Stefan? <laughs> Please, start. Yeah. Oh. <clears throat> oh. One. Now we start here in the front, and then we go to Santos. So if we go back to slide number one. But of Gustavo's slides, or? Yeah. Yeah, of no. your, the then first I'll, one. I will have, I will have <laughs> time, time for, for lunch. lunch. <laughs> <laughs> Again. <laughs> Let me go back. I don't know if I can go back. No, but the... Oh. Okay, this Let them do it, thing. please. Okay. <laughs> please go back. Yeah, because it's, it's quite interesting the, the way how you are giving the first figure. No, first... The, the first no, of innovation and digital readiness. The, after point... Yeah, one. this one, yeah. I guess, yeah. right? This one, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so... This is actually the answer and the thing that we should all consider you know, within our companies. Because as he said, 70% of executives report that innovation is a top three priority. And I believe that out of those 75%, most of those be, uh, understood the question is, do you have IT in your own companies? Because innovation and IT are completely two different things. While the 20% that are ready to scale innovation are the ones that have already done research and increased capacities within their own system and their own IT to meet the demands of all the customer needs. So for example, nowadays all the companies, we believe that we are moving into a financial uh, sector and we need to be very proactive towards it. But I believe that none of the companies out of 75% up but the ones 20% down, uh, have already established their research team within the companies, providing all the inputs and outputs for making a good strategy and tackling the issues. It's not that you need to come to a conference to understand that the system is going, the UPU IT data center is going, the CDS, uh, APS, uh, they are concrete right now. It's not like everyone need to comply with, but you need to understand before coming to the conference. And at the same time, if you go to the other slide, we go next to the other slide. So it's just a comment, just for making the other persons in mm. this room not feeling sleepy. They need mm. to wake up yeah, yeah. <laughs> because this is uh, the innovation uh, session and it's like scaling up our opportunities with two guys that are speaking a language that is common for us. So you are not speaking very technical. So it's not that boring. It's mm. good to, to participate. <laughs> Uh, if we move on, there was this purchase uh, in terms of uh, people in America, the acceptance of people oh. in America, because it's a nice way of approaching um, our marketing strategies and communication. So if we see up, up there, there is a share of U.S. households using specific technologies, and you said that now the changes are within decades. It's not that we should wait a lot of time for those changes. What we need to understand now in the background is that we need to define who is the beneficiary out of all the systems that are on the site. It's again us, the humans. So every time that the human aspect is being involved in a corporate, um, uh, let's say, strategy or acceptance, things change. Why? Because we believe that uh, if I could have a household refrigerator, I could be very fancy and I can spend uh, the all day speaking with the friends about the technology. It's about speaking about myself. That's the big difference. That if you are with a group of people speaking IT, it would be fun to speak in technical details, 
But if you are a consumer and you step in each of the, the, the things that are on the site, television, automobile and stuff, the sentence coming from consumer behavior is that I'm doing household refrigerator, I'm doing the television, so the brands and the companies behind it, they don't matter. What it matters is to meet the customer needs. And right now, our customers want to get everything delivered. They don't want to have any pain and any headache uh, regarding the custom system, whether that one is prohibited or not prohibited in the list of items that uh, need to be trans uh, transported through the post. Because there is always the next solution that is Amazon, Darknet, and stuff. So we don't need post for that. We can m switch to the other one. While from the other side, we have the technology side. That if that thing proves to be for my own purpose, that means that it's the right one. And we don't care about the brand. So when, it's, when we speak about the innovation, I think that both companies here, and I don't know if there is any other company, innovative company, that can take the floor and at least open the debates whether uh, the UPU is, is it doing the right thing? Is it uh, the nice approach to open up UPU for uh, other companies to join and share their own expertise? Are we speaking the same language? Because I believe that opening up of UPU is one of the best ideas that we have uh, had so far. <laughs> From the technical side. So it means that we are standardized. <laughs> And we are the leader, actually, mm. in the sector. So that's, that's a confirmation that I want to have from, mm. from the floor. Sorry, well, I took your position. No, no, no. Just, no. <laughs> just for freshening <laughs> up, okay? It's the audience that needs to come, yeah. and that's perfect. So great, yeah. thank you. Uh, uh, if you can give the two, two back, so to Santosh. Just, just before, uh, I want to um, comment something on this slide. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, that I didn't mention. I mean, here you can see at the very bottom uh, right the Amazon Prime users. I mean, it took one year and a half to basically 40% uh, of the Amazon clients to, to become Amazon Prime user. I mean, nothing. And now you see the landline. I mean, now the decrease of landline is, is that happening worldwide. I mean, I don't have a landline. I know almost nobody who has still a landline. I mean, th that's. Yeah, it's very important uh, uh, to to take that into account, and because innovation at the end is also for the end user, and we are all the end users. Yeah. Okay, Santos, and then Kate, and then I think sure. we have to close that. Okay, working? and you, and then we have to close the session. Sure. Can you guys hear me? <laughs> yes, please go so ahead, Santos. Just a reference on this. Usually, if you really want to see the adoption, look at only the last ten years. That's when the technology changed. So if you talk about history from 1903, the reference is not really valid. Just a point. Because this is the adoption of any technology has changed. The acceleration of any technology in the last 10 years is 100 times more than what it was before. But anyway, that was not the reason I call. So two points. One on the innovation. It sometimes is not just about the product or idea. It's about the ability of the leader to execute. There are early adopters who take risk and to do that, and there are some people, some companies will always be the last one to do that part. And second is, how do you manage the IP rights of partners if they are part of, the, if some of those solutions uses them? How do you, what are the policies for UPU? Like if WSPS, WPSPs join us, join the UPU and start working on standardization or mm -hmm. some of those things, have you figured out a policy for protecting the partner's IP? Yeah, I mean, there, there are different kind of partnership and uh, legal agreements that uh, the UPU have in, in this regard, also regard of data protection. I mean, the, my, my colleague was uh, mentioning also about competition. I mean, uh, this is a concept that the specifically the Postal Technology Center is very familiar. Uh, we have at the same time Australia Post, uh, uh, Spain, uh, South African Post, and Mexico using a product, uh, at the same time they are putting money to make it better. So it's a, it's a, a concept that let's work together through one common goal. So I mean, there are definitely rules and, uh, in place to, to, to protect this kind of uh, intellectual property. Yeah. You just hand it back if possible. Kate has a question. And then we come to the very front um, again. Okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, Kate, Kate Muth from the International Mail Advisory Group. Um, 
I do think opening up to the wider postal sector is one of the best ideas. Unfortunately, it's not a new idea. It's about 30 years old. We've been trying to open uh, more widely to the private sector. But one of the things I wanted to note was I think there's a little bit of a tension. I heard it from this gentleman over here when he was asking when something would be happening and how quickly could it happen. And I think the private sector moves at a much faster speed than the UPU. And that's, you know, that's not a knock. We're the private sector and, and you're uh, an international bureaucratic organization. But um, one of the things, and then I also heard, uh, I think, Stefan, you had mentioned that there was a development team and uh, another team within the PTC. But what's missing is a sales and marketing team. And that's what the private sector can bring. And that's kind of the... And, I'm giving a teaser on my, my, uh, what I'll say when I speak at the um, conference on postal regulation. But I think um, what the private sector can do is to can help to take that piece that's missing, which is to take it to more widely to the end user to build volume for the, uh, for the designated operators. And we have a really good example in the United States of the uh, work sharing program. And some of my members literally sell the postal services products and services. They are the PC postage providers. They literally sell postage. So I think you have some really good models, and I'm excited about the opportunities that the consultative committee can bring, and I hope we can work together. It wasn't really a question, but it was just kind of tying some pieces together. But perhaps the question is, can we move at the same speed of innovation when the private sector is used to things happening so much faster? I will, I will comment a bit on that. I mean, <laughs> I mean the, the UPU, as you all know, yeah, it's a very own institution. But at, at the same time, I mean, in order to move fast, then you also have to partner with those who can move fast. I mean, like startups, with those with experience. And, uh, and definitely, yeah, I mean, there is, a, there is a framework, there is currently some uh, activities within the UPU, there's going to be create a think tank, uh, innovation lab, I mean, there are the footprints there uh, to, to move, to be more agile in the, in the sense that uh, to try to catch up with, the, with the, what is going in the private sector. So, I mean, but of course we need the collaboration and we need the support from uh, different stakeholders to, to reach that. And uh, as you can imagine, it cannot be from one day to the next. But I think moving one step at a time, we will reach that point. OK, perfect. Thank you. So again, last statement for this session, please. <laughs> OK, uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you, Gustav, for, for, for that uh, presentation. Um, the post has existed for over a century, and we are still here. And uh, I think we may be underplaying the amount of innovation that is happening within the post. And I would love that uh, um, uh, next time, I always talk about next time, next time we try and zoom in more on the uh, postal players to say what innovations have they come up with over the years? Because it's not by chance that they are still in existence now when the Nokias have come and gone. It's because they adapt, they, are, they innovate. I don't know what else they do, but I believe that uh, for our, our story to come out uh, nicely, we need more examples from within the post, and I believe they are there, and we need to showcase these not only to motivate others, but also uh, for us to see the direction where we are coming and definitely push us going forward. And uh, once more, thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. And I think the UPU, I mean, you're moving now in this direction with the Innovation Forum, for example, the end of this week. Yeah. I mean, there are a few new initiatives where I think really it's what are new solutions, what are new technologies, how innovative postal operators are, and some of those initiatives are directly mirrored with what you have been saying. Yeah, we, yeah. we are together on that one. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. I have to, I have to close uh, this session here for now. Thank you very much to both of you, but you, they will both stay for the next session. <laughs> so we will make a very short break. Um,
uh, five to ten minutes, I keep it reflexly, because we are changing the setup here slightly, because we are bringing in diversity now, we are bringing in some private sector partners with the two of you, and we have high tables where we are going to stand around, so it's a couple of people then on the stage, so we have to change the setup. Uh, so maybe we can do that rather quickly, and we can quickly start with the second session, please. So don't go too far away, please. <laughs>